Um, so we are extremely glad to have you here. It's a very friendly event, and we with Romatske has invited all of you. Edward Lucas uh, is a very famous journalist, an expert on security, espionage, uh, economy, Eastern Europe, everything you can imagine, everything which matters in this part of the world. Um, Edward is the, uh, the senior editor of The Economist, uh, well-known publication. He's a senior vice president of SIPA, Central European Policy Agency, and the author of the number of books. One of the most famous is The New Cold War, which had been published in 2008. Mm -hmm. And so when we met with Ed uh, many times within this couple of years of the um, all kind of conferences, Edward said, like, Romatske, I really want to help you with something. I'll be briefly in Kiev. What can I do? Um, please use me. And we are very modest, uh, so we think that we are not at all egoistic, and we think if he is here, it's all for you. So, Edward, thanks so much for being with us, coming for a Romatske event and doing that for all our great friends and supporters and partners. Well... Thanks very much indeed, Natalia, for that. And it's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many people, including some old friends, some people I've known for really many, many years here. And it's an honor to be able to talk to, um, talk, talk to you all. Um, I want to say right at the beginning that I expect you'll disagree with me on some things, and I really hope you will, and that you won't just disagree silently, but you'll put your hand up and tell me um, in a question um, or statement where I'm wrong, because it's much more interesting to have a real discussion than just to um, agree that Putin's bad. I guess we all, we, we all know that. Um, and I'm going to try and be um, controversial and maybe say some things that not everybody in the room will, will agree with. Um, I'm going to mainly concentrate on where we are now and um, how things are going to develop. But I do just want to start off, particularly with this sort of audience, to say that the people in the West who found the events of 2014 and afterwards a surprise were making a big mistake, not just then, but they'd be making the same mistake for the previous uh, 25 years. If you think that Putin turned nasty and that Russia suddenly became a problem, that's because you weren't paying attention. And there were people in this part of the world, um, Ukrainians, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, and others, who were warning right back in the early 90s, at the time the Soviet Union was collapsing and when the Russian Federation was taking shape, that this wasn't going to end well, that we had some very troubling tendencies. Um, there were people like Lennart Meri, the Estonian president, Vitatis Landsbergis, then the Lithuanian leader, um, Václav Havel, who I was proud to call a friend, who I'd known since he was a dissident um, in, the Czech, in the then Czechoslovakia. And they were warning the West, and the West wouldn't listen. Um, Western leaders, Western policymakers, Western experts said, you guys have post-traumatic stress disorder, you don't really understand that Russia's changed, you're imprisoned by the past, you've got to just uh, wake up and see that this is a new Europe we're building and drop all this old paranoid thinking. Russia is a democracy, Russia is a market economy, um, Russia has signed up to the Paris Charter and all these other wonderful things, and nothing's going to go wrong, so please stop complaining. But it wasn't just a mistake about Russia. Um, I think the West made some other mistakes as well, which Russia is now exploiting. Um, one of them was the idea that now that the Cold War is over and communism has collapsed and capitalism has won, we can just get on and make money. Um, there's a phrase in Latin, pecunia non olet, money doesn't smell. And that was, I think, a category mistake that the West made, that money's neutral, business is good, bigger business is even better, bigger profits are even better, and we can be very relaxed about oligarchs and tycoons and the, um, the way they make their money and the way they spend their money. And we are really living with the consequences of that now not only UK and Ukraine, but we in London see huge tides of dirty money flowing into our property market and our financial system through anonymous offshore companies. And we let that problem develop. 
That wasn't something that anybody made us do. We weren't invaded and told you have to open your financial system up to criminals and oligarchs and tycoons and plutocrats and all these people. That was something we did to ourselves because we were greedy. Another problem, and I'll get onto this a bit more in a moment, was to think that because Western media had won the Cold War, as we thought, BBC World Service, where I worked in the 1980s, Radio Liberty, Voice of America, um, that the whole idea of, of free media run by um, ethical, upstanding journalists, that was eternal. Nothing could ever go wrong. We didn't need to worry about propaganda attacks anymore. We didn't need to worry about the future of our media because it was invincible. It was going to be fine forever. And actually, that was another big mistake. And I'll get onto this a bit more later on, but we've seen severe challenge to journalistic ethics and a catastrophic collapse of the business model that supports most private sector um, Western journalism. And we are sort of grappling with the consequences of that and trying to do um, what we can. But I don't think we're even at the beginning. We've barely formulated the question, let alone um, got the answer. So, so much for the mistakes of the past. Where are we now? Well, if you, I was a student in communist Eastern Europe, and I actually studied a little bit of dialectical materialism, which is something that people have mostly forgotten these days, and a good thing too. But one of the phrases that used to come up again and again was the correlation of forces, the objective correlation of forces. And older people in the audience may um, remember this. Look at GDP, for example. The combined GDP of the West is well over $40 trillion dollars roughly $20 trillion in Europe, roughly $20 trillion, $20 trillion in North America. Add in, um, if you want, the Japanese or the Australians, a few other Western allies, the Taiwanese, it's very comfortably $40 trillion. And look at Russia's GDP, it's $1.6 trillion. And the West's GDP is basically going up, and Russia's GDP is basically going down. So no contest there. Similarly, if you look at population, put the combined population of Europe and North America, North America together, and it's well over 800 million. Add in the Turks, add in the Japanese, add in others, and you very quickly get up to a billion. So the West is kind of a billion people, and it's up against a country of 140 million, maybe 141, 142, but, but with very bad demographics and going down. So the first question when we look around and say, where are we? is to ask ourselves, why is it that we are losing? We are bigger than Russia, we're richer than Russia, we've got bigger armed forces than Russia, we are more powerful than Russia in every way. So why is Russia having all these successes? Why does it get away with things again and again and again? It gets away with it in Syria, gets away with it in European security, gets away with it when it comes to diplomacy about the future of the internet. Again and again, Russia is scoring points off the West, sometimes just trivial symbolic points, sometimes really serious practical points. Why does it succeed? Well, go back to Clausewitz, the great German theorist of war and conflict. And Clausewitz said, and I think this is absolutely fundamental for understanding um, where we are, that if you have two adversaries, and one of them has great means and weak will, and the other has weak means and great will, then the one with the great will and the weak means will triumph because he can do things that the other side can't. And that is exactly where we are with Russia. Putin is prepared to do things that we are not prepared to do. He's prepared to accept economic pain, quite a lot of it. We'll get onto that a bit more later on. The West hates the idea of economic pain. We find it really difficult to scrape together money for defense spending, even in frontline states. Even in Lithuania and Latvia, they've had a real struggle to get their defence spending up to 2% of GDP, despite enormous political pressure from the United States and from other NATO countries, and despite the fact that Russia regularly conducts military exercises in which it rehearses the invasion and occupation of these countries. And it's still difficult to get to 2%. So we don't like economic pain. We don't like sanctions. We don't like taxes. We don't like having to take money away from things that our voters like and put it into things that are good for them. Putin's also um, willing to take risks. And we don't like taking risks. We operate on a very consensual basis. Um, we think that risks are bad. And when our leaders are put in a difficult situation, they don't think, hey, I'll roll the dice, see what happens. 
And Putin's willing to roll the dice. He rolls the dice again and again. Sometimes it works out, and sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't work out, he denies that he rolled the dice and says, those, those weren't dice, and those aren't my soldiers, and they're not in Ukraine, and the whole thing's made up, and we didn't shoot down that airliner. And he gets away with it, because that's the third thing he can do. He's willing to lie. And we are very hung up in the West on the concept of truth, and I like that. Our politicians do not habitually tell brazen lies in public. They may mislead voters sometimes. I'm not saying that they are paragons of truthfulness, but there's a basic taboo in the West against invading another country and then denying that you've done it. We don't have, we, our, our public culture doesn't accept those sort of lies. And Putin does, so these are three things that he's willing to do. So what have we done against him? It's not all hopeless, and I'm very much against this kind of defeatist do-mongering, where people say the West is fundamentally unwilling to challenge Putin. We've been, we face an existential threat to our security, and we've totally failed. Now, if that was true, I would be the first person to say it. And I've been a very harsh critic of the West for many years, right back to the early 90s, when I thought we were making some big mistakes in dealing um, with Russia back then. But it's simply not true to say the West has done nothing. We can argue it's not enough, and I'll get onto that in a moment, but stuff has happened. I'll start off with the EU. I was, um, I, as you know, I work at The Economist, and I was in a senior editorial role at the time of the war in Georgia in 2008. And we put on the cover of The Economist, I think one of the best ever covers, which was a picture of a jelly, a big jelly. And on the side of the jelly, we put the faces of the European leaders at the time. And the title of this cover story, this cover, was Europe Stands Up to Russia. And our very brilliant cover designer made to make the jelly look as if it was wobbling a little bit. If you remember, we stood up to Russia in 2008 by putting the weakest possible sanctions we could put on Russia. We put them on for the shortest possible time and then lifted them. And that was the European response to the war in Georgia. And that's just not true now. We have real European sanctions. They're very unpopular with some European countries. And Angela Merkel has done a fantastic job in getting countries like Italy and Greece and Spain and Portugal and Cyprus, countries that have no desire to pick a fight with Russia, and she got them to sign up for sanctions, and they've renewed the sanctions. Now, do I wish they were bigger and tougher? Absolutely I do. Are they enough? No, they're not. But it's something. This is the toughest external economic sanction that the European Union has taken. It's, pretty, it's, it's impressive. Um, I'd also point out that on energy, the European Union has transformed its energy policy towards Russia. Now, unfortunately, I live in Britain, and the British people are um, very unwilling to understand that uh, the European Union ever does anything good, and also we don't import any Russian gas, so this is not part of a, the, the British political debate, but it happens to be true that the combination of Commissioner Ertinger in energy and Commissioner Verstager in, and I apologize if there are any Danes here, I know I haven't pronounced it, but it's Verstager, I think, but I can't pronounce Danish words properly, um, in competition, have had a fundamental effect on Russia's energy grip on the eastern half of Europe. We, have, we used to have pipelines that only went east-west. We now have the beginnings of a north-south gas grid. It's no longer possible for Russia to cut off one country and know that it can't import gas from anywhere else. We've improved storage, we've improved data, so we actually know what's happening. All this comes as a result, of course, of Russia using its transit across Ukraine to exert pressure on Ukraine and also to exert pressure on Europe. But the result of that is that Europe's pretty much woken up. We now understand, in a way that we didn't understand 10 years ago, that gas can be a political weapon, and we've done something about it. We've also um, applied the Competition Commission to Russia's corrupt and exploitative gas export model, which used to charge friendly countries less and unfriendly countries more. 
uh, which um, involved a large amount of corruption, mysterious intermediary companies that owned no gas pipelines, no gas storage, didn't have any customers, but somehow were able to make hundreds of millions or billions of dollars out of these um, cross-border gas shipments. And that's all changed now. You know, Gazprom has been brought to heel by the European Community, by the European uh, Commission, in the same way as Microsoft was in the past. Microsoft didn't take the European Commission seriously, and they woke up one morning and they were being fined hundreds of millions of euros. And Gazprom also didn't take the European Commission seriously. And I talked to Gazprom people about this back in 2006, 2007. I said, well, I'm not a competition lawyer, but it looks to me like you're breaking EU competition law. And they said to me, you know what? We'll manage, because in the end, and this is a very Russian way of thinking, the European Union is basically run by Germany. And we have excellent relations with Chancellor Schroeder. And rest assured, if they try and do anything, our German friends will stop it. Well, big mistake. First of all, Schroeder stopped being Chancellor and Merkel came in and she can smell a Czechist at 200 meters away because she grew up in East Germany. And the European Commission has real teeth. And they have humiliated Gazprom. Gazprom's business model is fundamentally broken. And there's still plenty more to come. Are we going to get class action lawsuits from all the people who've been overcharged in all the countries where they were charging um, excessive prices? We'll wait and see. But this is fundamental stuff. And if anyone says the European Union can't stand up to Russia, I would say not a bit of it. We've also seen, and this is only at a very beginning stage, the European Union beginning to take Russian propaganda seriously. Now, this was a total taboo only two or three years ago. I was talking to people in the External Action Service, in the Commission, in the Council, and I was saying, what are you doing about Russian information warfare? And they said, you know what? We don't believe in it. We believe in a free press, and surely you're not saying that we should be putting the media under government control here in Europe. And I said, no, I'm not saying that, but what are you doing about Russian propaganda attacks? They're happening. They're happening against EU countries. And I was basically laughed at. And now we see the External Action Service producing, I think, the best weekly disinformation bulletin produced anywhere in the West. It's not as good as what you do here in Ukraine with your fantastic stop fake and other efforts, because you know, we should all be learning from you and what you do. It's, it's really, um, you, you, you are the gold standard in dealing with this. But for the European Union to have a weekly disinformation bulletin coming out, is a really big deal. If anybody here doesn't subscribe to it, please subscribe to it and tweet it and retweet it and really make a big deal of it because it's produced, basically, it's three people. One Czech guy called Jakob, who has no budget, and his salary is paid by the Czech Foreign Ministry, and a couple of other people from friendly um, frontline states. But it still, it comes out with the EEAS um, logo on it. And it's a really, it's a, it's a profound shift that they're doing that. Um, We've also seen NATO transforming itself. I remember 2006, after the Baltic states had joined, um, had, had joined NATO, talking to senior NATO officials and saying, this is kind of worrying. You are making the Baltic states get rid of their territorial defense capability in order to have expeditionary capability in Afghanistan. And that's fine. I'm delighted that the Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, and Poles and others are going off to missions in Afghanistan and elsewhere. But they are frontline states, and Russia is building up its forces on their border. Russia has exercises all the time. And you should be thinking about territorial defense. And I was told in categorical terms by very senior NATO officials, this is profoundly unhelpful. Stop saying this, don't write it, because if you treat Russia as enemy, then maybe one day Russia will become an enemy. And it will not help the security of the frontline states if we go down that road. And I said, trouble is, I think Russia's already gone down that road. It went round down that road several years ago. And you will not make this problem go away by shutting your eyes to it. Anyway, what a lot has changed. I remember in 2007, the Poles went to NATO and they said, we're really worried now and we're a big country, so you know, listen to us. We need some plans. We do not have even the rudimentary contingency plans to defend Poland and the Baltic states against Russia. And they were told, and this is a military secret, but it was in The Economist, so I can tell you. Um, they were told, you can't, we can't make Russia part of our threat assessment and therefore we can't make plans against Russia. We can make Belarus part of our threat assessment, and so you can have some plans for defending 
um, Poland against an attack by Belarus and perhaps some unspecified Belarusian allies. And that was the best the Poles could get. And that was Poland with Radek Sikorski as defence minister and a pretty heavy-hitting country um, with a heavy-hitting minister. And for the Baltic states, nothing. And that changed thanks to the Obama administration. And it's very fashionable to criticise Obama as a disastrous president, the worst since Jimmy Carter. Many things you can say about him. But it was he who flicked that switch in 2008. He said, I don't get it. We have plans to defend Norway. We have plans to defend Turkey. We have plans to defend Portugal. We don't have plans to, defe to defend the only countries that might actually be attacked. And that's got to change. And so we got another military secret, which we had in The Economist, I can tell you. We got the Eagle Guardian reinforcement plans to the Baltic states. Very basic, basically saying to the Poles, here's the deal. You put the best third of your army in the Baltic states to defend them, and when we get round to it, we'll send some troops to defend you. So nice to the Baltics, not quite so good from a Polish point of view, but they went along with it because it was better than nothing. But now that's been upgraded. We now have real reinforcement plans. Um, real plans to get troops into the Baltics. We have the um, very rapid reaction force, we have the NATO response force, we have NATO force integration units, and we have exercises. It was completely taboo to have any sort of, you could have mine-sweeping exercises in the Baltic Sea where you practiced looking for World War II mines, but anything else might offend the Russians, so don't do it. Well, since then, we've had the Steadfast Jazz exercise in Poland, and now we've got Anaconda, six, Anaconda 16. This is sending a very serious message to the Russians. Is it enough? No. But it's an enormous shift for NATO. It's a really, really big deal. Um, territorial defence is now NATO's number one priority. And I'm really strongly against people saying NATO isn't doing anything. Yeah, that's playing into the Russians' hands. Can NATO do more? Yes. Will it do more at the, alliance, the, the summit in Warsaw in July? Yes, there's some more stuff that will, that will come out. Um, we should be encouraging um, it. And I particularly, I want to see a standing defence plan. And we need to do a lot more on all the non-military stuff. We need to do more on information warfare. We need to do more on cyber. We need to do more on economics. And I'll get onto that a bit later on. But I, I don't think anyone can doubt that NATO is going in the right direction. Now, that's no great comfort for Ukrainians and Moldovans and Georgians who are not in NATO. Um, but I would rather have, um, it's still better, I think, to have NATO functioning as a defence alliance. It's not. It acts as a, it acts as a deterrent and encourages um, also the integration of non-NATO countries into what NATO is doing. It's really interesting the way we are seeing Sweden and Finland taking part in NATO exercises. And I think there's plenty of potential also to have um, Ukrainian forces taking part as well, and indeed they do. So what now? It's not hopeless, but what have we still got to do? Well, I think the first thing is we've still got to understand Russia better. We've got to understand Russia up to Ukrainian standards, and they're pretty high, because you basically get it in a way that most Westerners don't, as I mentioned at the beginning. And I think the fundamental point to get across, and many in the West still don't do this, is there's no point playing win-win with people who want to play win-lose. Now, Russia loves the idea of win-win. They say, that is fantastic, good, we can talk about this. Yes, very good, yes. And then at the end of it, you work out they got what they wanted, and you've lost. Now, I'm entirely in favour of... I, I studied game theory at university. I'm absolutely convinced that if you can have a win-win outcome, it will be better than a win-lose. Um, any conceivable win-win outcome will be better than a win-lose outcome. But that doesn't work when you're dealing with people like Putin. So we've got to accept, for the moment, we are in a zero-sum game with Russia. And until we accept that, we're always going to be getting things a bit wrong. That's why I'm against Juncker going to the St. Petersburg Economic Forum to try and reopen negotiations. I'm all in favour of, of, of talking to the Russians, that's fine. But my idea of talking to the Russians would be to say things like, hi guys, we've got your money. If you want to see it again, back off. That is a good sort of talking to the Russians. But I don't believe in sitting down in negotiations and saying, OK, you want some stuff and we want some stuff, so let's try and work out a way that we're both happy. Because it just doesn't work. Uh, we need to um, change our conceptual framework um, for dealing with the Putin regime. We also need to understand, as I said at the beginning, that Putin is quite happy to accept economic pain. 
And I still get this a lot when I talk to Western governments in America and in Britain and elsewhere, where people say, look, fundamentally, Putin is a rational actor. He responds to carrots, he responds to sticks. It's not in his interest to see Russia going down the economic plug hole. And we need to offer him some kind of way in which he can save face in Ukraine and get back to trying to modernize the Russian economy. Because in the end, that's what he wants. Oh, no, he doesn't. Now, he's not against economic growth. It's always nice to have more money and the more mon the, the less money and the more money there is, the more you can steal. So this is kind of good from the, the Putin regime's point of view. But Putin does not sit there in the morning thinking, oh dear, Russian GDP is going down. What do I have to do about it? That may be the way Western leaders respond. It may be the way <coughs> authoritarian leaders respond if they really committed to modernizing their country. I think the Chinese genuinely want Chinese GDP to go up and they want to continue the modernization of China. For Putin, these are incidental priorities. The first thing it, for him is to stay in power. And the second thing is to try and divide and weaken the West because he sees that as a necessary and possibly even a sufficient condition for staying in power. So stop thinking about Putin as a rational economic actor. It's also very important not to overestimate Putin's strengths. And I think there's a tendency sometimes to think that, all, that the Russian security services are omniscient and omnipotent. They know everything and they can do everything. There's no obstacle they can't overcome. Um, and it's almost impossible or completely impossible to keep a secret from them. Well, I think that's ascribing too much credit to them. This is a country which has not, despite unlimited amounts of money and unlimited amounts of political authority, has not succeeded in the fairly basic task of building a road from one end of the country to the other. You still can't drive a truck on a proper road from Moscow to Vladivostok. So if they can't build roads properly, and they can't run their tax system properly, and they can't do, if every other bit of the state bureaucracy and infrastructure is plagued by delay and corruption and inefficiency, why do we believe that that is not also the case for their military and security services? Doesn't mean they're not a threat, doesn't mean we shouldn't take them very seriously, doesn't mean that we need to do a lot more to counter them, but don't let's ascribe to them Harry Potter sort of powers. They're just humans, they are another post-Soviet bureaucracy with all the corruption and incompetence and feuding that that entails. And because they are corrupt and incompetent and fighting with each other, that offers us some opportunities. They play divide and rule with us. Well, we can play, try playing divide and rule with them. Um, we should be looking for um, their Achilles heels wherever we can find them. And paradoxically, I think the biggest Achilles heel is that their anti-Westernism is something that they preach, but it's not something that they practice. I don't see the Russian elite sending their children to go and study in brotherly Belarus. I don't see the Russian elite actually sending their children to study in the strategic partner China. Yeah, they may be happy their children can learn. They send their children to LSE, my alma mater. They send their children, if they can, to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Stanford and places like that and MIT. And I also don't notice them saving up their money and in investing it in brotherly Belarus or strategic partner China. They would like to invest their money in Switzerland, in Austria, and actually most of all in London and New York. They don't tend to go to Belarus for dental treatment. They tend to go to the West when they have any, any medical condition. Um, they tend not to go on holiday in brotherly Belarus or strategic partner China. They may do it once or twice for a laugh, but basically they like to go skiing in the French Alps and to the southern coast of France and to um, nice nightclubs in London. So this anti-Westernism is a real Achilles heel for them. And this gives, I'll get onto this a bit later on, but this gives us a, a big place to push back. But let's not demonize them. They look very scary. You know, I would not like to meet Patrushev or Sechin or one of these guys in a dark alley. They have formidable capabilities when they want to exercise them, but they are not all-powerful. We, um, we, we have ways of dealing with them. They have big weaknesses. Um, but we also shouldn't fall into another big Western trap, which is to say Russia is fundamentally a declining country, and therefore it's not a problem. I agree it's fundamentally a declining country, but that, that therefore 
is a category mistake. And I was in Washington the other day briefing the American government, and the big pushback I was getting from the Pentagon and from um, people in, in Congress and from the intelligence agencies was, don't we have to worry so much about China that we shouldn't worry about Russia? And that's a really big mistake, and it's a particularly big mistake for the, for, for, the, for, the, for the Americans, and I'll explain why. Just because Russia's declining doesn't mean it can't make a tremendous mess. In fact, because it's declining, Putin can be desperate, and desperate people make bad decisions and roll the dice. I would be, in a way, happier with a Russia that was basically stable and growing at 1% or 2% a year um, than a Russia that is in danger of falling apart where the economy is, for, is declining at 5 or 6% a year. Because I think Putin may feel he's got a window of opportunity. The West is gradually getting its act together. Russia's gradually getting weaker. If he's going to bust the West fundamentally, divide NATO, divide the European Union, get back to the kind of bilateral world in which Russia feels happy, he's maybe only got a few years to do it, and that's really dangerous. But there's a particular point for the Americans. If you want to contain China, you can only do it with allies. And if you want your allies to take you seriously, you have to show that you take allies seriously everywhere. And I get this again and again from the Taiwanese, from the South Koreans, Philippines, from all the other, the Japanese, from all the al American allies in East Asia. And they say, we are watching very closely what America does in Eastern Europe. Because, and I'm quoting a Japanese uh, uh, diplomat here, so this is not racist. He said, if the Americans won't look after white people, if they won't look after Europeans, to whom they are tied by decades of Cold War alliance, very close family and cultural links, if they won't look, up, won't look after the Europeans, what chance have we got? So if America wants to maintain its role as the global leader, and if it's worried about China, and they're right to be worried about China, they have to stand by their European um, allies. So that's a particular point for the Americans. The targeted use of corruption. Again, in the country of Viktor Yanukovych, you don't need a long lecture about this. But you can buy people. You buy politicians, you buy political parties, you buy media, you buy think tanks, you buy universities. As I said at the beginning, money is a big Achilles heel in the West. <coughs> and although Russia is not a rich country by Western standards, they can spend a million here, 10 million there, 100,000 there. And for a lot of people, that's real money. You can buy people for that. And we have been very bad about prosecuting people who take Russian money. So I'll get on to that a bit more in a moment. The use of organized crime networks. Um, this has been particularly the case in Spain. But organized crime is really useful. You can use them to intimidate people. You can use them to secure your investments. You can use them to gather intelligence. Organ gang when you've got gangsters working for you, they can do things that even your intelligence officers can't do. Um, the use of intelligence. Um, both in terms of collecting intelligence and finding out what's going on, and in terms of active measures. Um, the rate which is everything from just giving a little shove here and there to influence events through to what they call a mockroid yellow, a wet job, a targeted assassination, which we've seen in my country, the assassination of Alexander Litvinenko, and I would say three or four other Russians living in London as well who've all met um, mysterious deaths or have narrowly escaped um, assassination. That has a really big effect because people are scared. Um, people think, I don't want to put my family at risk. Um, you don't just have to intimidate um, the Westerners, uh, the, the Russians, you can intimidate um, Westerners as, as well. Another point about corruption is it doesn't just buy you influence, it also destroys public confidence in the system. Why, if you see that your politicians are on the take, taking money from a foreign power, driving Porsches on, small official, on their small official salaries, sending their children to be educated abroad, wearing expensive watches, all this sort of stuff. And then you start thinking, well, why should I pay taxes for this country? Why should I die for this country? Why should I care about this country? Why should I stay in this country if the people who are running it um, are so obviously corrupt? So corruption is a weapon that cuts both ways. The use of propaganda, I've mentioned already. This works particularly well in the Russian-speaking world because... Uh, Russian television is very slickly produced. It's a real, it's real showbiz. I watch 
um, Destiny Nidelli and these other programs, and they are produced to very high standards. They're, they're good to watch. And I particularly like watching it because every now and again they're rude about me and my friends. And although I've, I always joke with Anne Applebaum, my friend, she won a Pulitzer Prize, but I had seven minutes devoted to me on Vyestny Nidelli, seven minutes denouncing me as the village idiot of British journalism. So I, was pretty, I, I would trade that for Pulitzer any, any day. But you can, they, they can use this Russian propaganda, uh, propaganda television all over the place, not only in the former Soviet Union, but a lot of Russians in Germany watch it. And with this very sophisticated um, case of the... Does everyone here know about the case of Lisa, the Lisa attack in Germany? Anyone not know about the Lisa attack? Anyone not? This, this is fantastic. This is the first time I've ever addressed an audience where everybody knew what I was talking about when I said Lisa. OK, but part of Lisa was using the, was, was using the fact that Russians... In, uh, the, the, the Russland Deutsche, the, the Germans of Russian heritage, still watch Russian television. I'm going to whiz through all this because I think you know this better than I do. So how do we deal with this hybrid? This is a joined-up threat. It hops from cyber warfare to intelligence to subversion to assassination to propaganda to kinetic military attacks to the use of targeted corruption to organised crime. All these are just tools in the Kremlin toolbox. How do we deal with that? It's really tricky. The first thing I want to say is we will not deal with that threat by mimicking it. We will not defeat Putinism by Putinizing our own societies. It'd be very easy to respond to this by saying, well, let's break down our barriers. Let's break down the barriers between government and journalism, because we should all be on the same side. Let's break down the barriers between government and business, because we should all be on the same side. Let's break down the barriers between the intelligence services and everything else, because we should all be on the same side. Now, I'm in favour of a security culture. I grew up during the Cold War, and I remember what it was like, and I worked in the BBC at the height of the Cold War, and I'm under no illusions that we all have to cooperate, but we can only cooperate from the basis of maintaining the legal and ethical and professional boundaries that make our society what it is. I don't want to be in a situation where MI6 phones up The Economist and tells us what to write, or BP phones up The Economist and tells us what to write, or where we are being different professions and different functions in society that the... Um, that we see all the time in Russia. But we do need a joined-up response. I mean, no doubt about that. And I'm moving very close towards the end of what I want to talk about. Um, let's look at where Russia is making its most headway. And let's fight back on that. Dirty money is the number one priority. We've really let you down. This is our problem. It's very common for Westerners to come to Ukraine and lecture Ukrainians about corruption. You know, Joe Biden downwards. And I'm sure no, one, no Ukrainian needs to be told what a scourge corruption is. But where does that corrupt money go? It doesn't stay in Ukraine. It goes to London. Every morning, I bicycle past a, an apartment, which is, I believe, the most expensive apartment in the whole of London. And it's owned by a Ukrainian. Now, did we really do the money laundering checks when he opened his bank account? Did the estate agent say, well, I'm very glad you want to buy this apartment? And I won't mention him by name because Mr. Akhmetov has a way of suing people who he doesn't like. Um, but did they really say, where did you get that money? Can you prove that you acquired that money honestly? I don't know. I would like to think so, but I have to say I have my doubts. So we have to crack down. On this, we have to crack down on the anonymous ownership of companies. Why is that allowed? When the joint stock company was invented, it was invented as a way of spreading risk. So you could go on a commercial expedition, and if the expedition failed, you didn't personally go bankrupt. And I'm in favour of that. I like joint stock companies, at least not necessarily for banks, but I, I think it's a, basically it's a good way of encouraging entrepreneurship. But nobody ever said that one of the benefits of this is anonymity. ABC Limited of British Virgin Islands, and if you force the British Virgin Islands to ask who owns ABC Limited, after a few months, they'll tell you it's XYZ Limited of Panama. And if you're very lucky, the Panamanians will tell you, yes, it's owned by P. 
PQR Limited of Liechtenstein. You go to Liechtenstein, and they probably won't tell you anything. If they do, they will say, oh, it's opened by CBA of the British Virgin Islands, and back you go again. And that's with the full force of law behind you. As an ordinary journalist or an ordinary public citizen, you have no chance of cracking open BVI or Panama or Liechtenstein, unless, of course, we get the Panama Papers, and that's fantastic, but you can't rely on that. So we have to do a better job, not just in these offshore territories, but in the city of London and in America, in Delaware, in Oregon, in Nevada, in all these places where you can register a company with an out-of-date driving license, which nobody checks, and no information is kept on the company afterwards, and nobody regulates the company formation agent, and then you can go anywhere in the world. As long as you don't make any money in the United States, they won't tax you and say, I'm an American company, I want to do business. That can't carry on. We have to do something on that. We also have to bolster our financial deterrent. I said before that the most powerful message I would like to see in talks with Putin is, we've got your money. If you want to see it again, back off. And we need to do a much better job in showing Russia that we can exercise a speedy financial deterrent. So if they start fighting and pushing towards Mariupol again, or if we get little green men in Latvia or Estonia or Lithuania or Poland or anywhere else, we need to be in a position where within 24 hours, we can do stuff that really, really hurts the Russian economy. Cut them off from the payment system, cut them off from the capital markets, cut them off... Um, from being traded in any um, international exchange um, and do that in a way that doesn't hurt our allies because there's no point in destroying the Russian economy if you've also destroyed the Ukrainian, Polish and Baltic economies. And we need to do it in a way where we see what the legal and procedural and regulatory obstacles are so we can do it really quickly. We can do it in conditions of cyber attack where our normal phones and emails aren't working. And if we do that, I think that is far more important in deterring Russia than whether we have one battalion or one brigade in the Baltic states. So I think there's plenty we can do, and I hope we're going to do it, and I'm working on it myself. Um, I'm going to leave most of the rest of the questions, but I want to finish off on this one thing. Please don't West wait for the West to come and save Ukraine. You're not a poor country. You're a poorly run country. You don't need Western money. You've got plenty of rich people in Ukraine. If they paid taxes, you'd have the money to do the stuff you need. You know more than we do. You have more experience than we do. Um, I actually think you can save the West more than the West can save Ukraine. We really need your advice and we need your experience. And most of all, we need you to survive. Thanks very much. Please prepare your questions, but um, I'll, um, as we agreed with Edward, I have a couple of them. Uh, so we, we would make it very short, so that we don't, that I don't misuse my position. Uh, there is a numbers. Uh, so very short, what is the first one thing to watch out from the Warsaw Summit? Um, it's a bit geeky, but it, and it'll probably, it, it, it's about whether we have a standing defense plan that if we fight, if, if there's a military conflict and it's fought only in the Baltics, then it's really, we never get there in time. We, you know, heavy armor from America, heavy weapons from the West. It's kept in places like Norway, which is great for the Cold War, less good for defending Latvia. And when we do war games, the problem is the Baltic states are quite small and the Russians get to the coast really quickly and then it's a fait accompli. NATO makes its decisions quite slowly and that's quite a difficult problem. That changes if we have what we had during the Cold War, which was a standing defense plan, which means if you attack any part of NATO anywhere, all of NATO attacks you everywhere. Now, I think that's still quite controversial in NATO, but if we can get there, that's a very big deterrent. The Russians then think we aren't worried about little green men. Um, yeah, we put our little green men in Latvia and suddenly, um, we have mines blocking our harbours in Vladivostok and Murmansk and Novorossiysk. And you know, we, we see yeah, American cruise missiles landing all over Russia. Now, I'm not sure what the political will is to do that, but having the plan would be good. And the other thing is pre-authorisation. By the time the North Atlantic Council meets, it's already too late. We, need, we have air policing in the Baltic states. They don't refer to Brussels or Mons before they take off. They take off as soon as someone crosses, the you know, Russian 
planes approach the airspace. We need to have the, a lot of political preauthorization for SACO, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, so when he sees something he doesn't like from his intelligence, he just says, right, guys, we're deploying, and within hours, you have thousands of NATO, other NATO forces in the Baltic. That would be really good. Um, I could go on. It's a big subject, so, but those are the main things. Yeah, we'd better to make a couple of short. One topic we rarely discuss, Ukrainian trade with Russia. Uh, we understand what are the sanctions, but there is no real uh, consensus on what the Ukrainian government should do in this position. Do you see as uh, going on with the trade and all the kind of cooperation as normal in this case, or probably Ukraine has to shut down all the cooperation? Well, I'm first of all, I think it, it is up to individual businesses um, to make their decisions. I don't, you, you, we won't win this by becoming a planned, a planned economy. Um, and I think it's important to keep some, you know, there are, there are a lot of Russians who don't like Putin either. And if you can maintain, if, if we're maintaining Russians, you know, the, the normal businesses in Russia who are just trying to do stuff and they want to buy Ukrainian goods and sell them in their shops and so on, I'm in favor of that. It's very much, it, the, the key thing is not to become over-dependent. And the Estonians, are there any Estonians in the room, by the way? I always feel guilty about... I'm an honorary Estonian, but it's always better when there's a real one. The Estonians have a sort of rule of thumb. You should never have more than 10% of your export market in anything in Russia. And then that means that Russia doesn't have much leverage. If, 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 if you're making money, it's nice. If they cut it off, it hurts a bit, but you're not too dependent. So I think you know, no wise Ukrainian should depend on Russia for more than 10% of their supply chain or on for more than 10% of their sales. So, um, that, would be, that would be a good model. So a couple of short ones, as well. again. Uh, we live in the time of gossips and conspiracy theories. One thing we are all puzzled, we have some of the Ukrainian politis, political prisoners, including Nadia, Nadia Savchenko, Gennady Afanasyev, all the others back. Some are still in the Russian prisons, up to 30 of them. But everybody's puzzled. What is the real price for that? I, I don't know, but I, I do remember, I mean, during the Cold War, we did spy swaps. You know, we did spy swaps with the Soviet Union, um, and we've done spy swaps with Russia. And in fact, with Russia, the people that we got back were people who, in not, we got four guys back for the 10 Russian spies we caught in 2010, and not all those four were spies. Um, some of them were just unjustly um, imprisoned. So I think, yeah, it's a pragmatic, if you catch Russian spies here, good. Why waste Ukrainian taxpayers' money on keeping them in prison if you can trade them for Ukrainians who've been, uh, um, who, who've been unjustly imprisoned in Russia? So I, 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 th I, I mean, I, I, I think this is, this is statecraft. This is something your, your leaders have to do, and if they get it wrong, vote them out. You said that you can't win Putin, Putinizing our own society. You have the great people, you have foreign journalists here working, Ukrainian journalists, and also a lot of people who try to keep Ukraine in the news uh, in different ways. Um, so in this very crazy environment of disinformation, what would be the main tip from you as experienced journalists? How to really keep the interest, reform the hazards, the troubles, and don't sacrifice the principles, don't Putinize yourself? Well, I think um, journalists have a very ambiguous professional ethic. Sometimes, when we want to, we say we're part of public life. So, I'm a, as a journalist, I'm an important part of the political process. You have to give me, make time for me. You have to look after me. I want to come first in the queue. Treat me like a, almost as if I'm a you know, politician or something like that. I, journalists love those privileges. And then when we don't want those privileges, we say we're part of the entertainment industry. I'm sorry, yeah, maybe it wasn't true, but it was an amusing story. And yeah, you know what? I just did it. My, edit my editor asked me to, and I don't feel very proud about it, but, you know, hey, that's journalism. And I think that ambiguity is, is unsustainable, actually. We have to decide, do we have real ethics, or are we part of the... If, if we are basically part of the entertainment business, then we have to be treated as part of the entertainment business. And if you work as a circus clown... You can make money and you can be very popular, but you can't expect to come first in the queue. Um, if you want to be part of public life, which is the kind of German idea of journalism as Meinungsbildung, well, then you have responsibilities and you must expect to play a pretty big penalty um, if you breach them. Now, I don't think these should be legal penalties, but I think journalists themselves have to be much tougher on saying this is professional ethics, this is what matters, 
um, I'm not going to do this story because I don't, I, I don't think it's ethical. And you said, that's what we have to do. I think that everybody else has to accept that journalists' job is to speak truth to power, is to do uncomfortable stories, stories that don't necessarily go against um, the short-term interests of the country, but it's the long-term interest of the country to have journalists, um, to have a free press. Um, and journalists will make mistakes. It's a, it's a price of having journalists, they make mistakes. If they aren't making mistakes, they're not journalists. If they're honest mistakes, you just have to put up with it. Um, but I think that you know, Ukraine so far has really been a terrific journalistic success story. You have, there's more free inquiry in both the Ukrainian and Russian languages in Ukraine um, than there is yeah, as a big country than there is in, in pretty much anywhere else. And as a big country, you at least have the chance of a business model. I don't know how we do um, real private sector journalism in a country with two, three, four, five million hard up people. The advertising isn't there, subscriptions isn't there. You at least have the chance in Ukraine of, of, de of, of, of a decent private sector, sector journalistic model. And um, from me, before thanking you, I'd like to thank, uh, to uh, really, I appreciate you coming. Uh, and I, uh, I encourage you, and first of all, I would announce with the satire, we would have our great satire program. Michael Schur is back in a couple of months when he's back from the army. Uh, so good news to uh, the Ukrainian audience. Please go to hromatsky.ua. We cover a lot of foreign news. We cover with the program Hromatsky Suite uh, every week. You can read all the explainers, so there is a lot. Uh, please share all the news in Russian about our Russian project and the project in, in English. Um, so um, that's what I um, what was very important for me to say. And I think it's not the last event uh, we are hosting. We are, first of all, the multimedia. Thank you very much.